One thing about geology, you have to be able to think in three dimensions. Like right here, we're, we're standing on top of that ash bed. And then if you look back at the embankment, you can see there's the ash. But you see the ash goes up a couple feet higher than what's next to us here. So yeah. you see part of, the, part of the ash has been removed. Right. So now I'm going to get back to your earlier question. And maybe I don't even have to answer that. <laughs> how how far below the hill? Did, didn't you ask something? Yeah, like that? yeah. How far below the hill is yeah. the, uh, well, is the fossil bed, or how how, uh, or how far below the top of the hill are the skeletons buried? Right here, you see that the hilltop was sloping down, so there's mm -hmm. actually less overburden over the fossil bed right here at the edge of the hillside right. than there would be back under the visitor center. Right. I'm sure this ash bed goes back under the visitor center, but it's more like 20 feet below where we were standing up there instead of a, a 12 or 15 feet. Right. But here, here's that uh, network of trenches that were dug back in the 1980s to try to determine if there were skeletons here. Mm -hmm. And you, you see, before they would even turn, consider turning this into a state park, we had to prove that there were skeletons in the ground. Right. So we were able to come up. The reason that we, we dug the trenches in a grid, um, you know, maps are set up on grids. So we had this pretty accurate map of where the skeletons were located. Right. And that, that way we could convince the, uh, uh, the donor and the administrator that this indeed would be a good place to put a, a, a building. Yeah. So right here you see that distinctive gray color, the well, silvery gray color. Yeah. Uh, being out of the weather, we've been able to kind of clean off the, keep it cleaner and make it uh, so that so that it still looks a little more light like the volcanic ash. Right. So about four feet of the ash bed was removed right here, mm -hmm. but there's still at least three feet oh, of wow. ash right down in front of us here. Right. Some of those microfossils that Patrick was finding up there give us evidence that there is water in this low spot. The pond turtles, the frogs, uh, salamanders, and uh, then also, if you take a look at the at this layer of ash right here, you can see some ripple marks, shallow water ripple marks. So, as those as as the wind would blow a puff of ash, and uh, uh, the ash would hit the surface of the water and settle out. After it settled. Uh, the wind movement create ripples at the yep. bottom. Right. And you see, that, and, and that continued uh, as the ash accumulated because here you've got smaller ripples going one direction at a little bit lower level than those larger ripples off to your left there. Yeah. Gosh, it's and right down here, here's room. part of a, uh, a rhino jaw and a couple yeah. other rhino bones out here. And those would be examples of, uh, of, of, of a scavenged fossil from, from the fossil bed. <coughs> no doubt. That's why it's up higher. Digging expands over here, and we work down right here. The rest of the skeleton could well be down there. Right. So this king size bone crushing dog has only been found uh, the direct evidence, an actual fossil in the water hole sand, and that's a part of a lower jaw. But then in the ash bed, we have the trace fossil evidence, the indirect evidence, the bite marks, the, the fossil scat, the coprolites, you may have noticed that up there. So their, their droppings are preserved. Right. You can tell that the dropping wasn't left by, by a plant eater, there's little pieces of bone in it, so uh, whatever left that had been chewing up the bone along with the meat. <laughs> so as you come along here then, you're gonna see uh, you know, like this, this little dog here. It was found in the water hole sand too, but then it's also been found in, in the ash layer, in the disaster layer. Well, most of the skeletons are rhinos, and they're, they're the ones that are this big, this shape. These are the full-grown rhinos anyway, so number three is a 
A full-grown barrel-bodied rhino. Number one is a full-grown barrel-bodied rhino. Take a look at number three over here, guys. This is an adult female. Females have the shorter tusks in the lower jaw. If you look right above her head, there's a little calf. Most of the calves are this size. So it looks like this rhino must have had a certain time of year when they had their young. Right, right. And, uh, and number one is a, uh, an adult rhino. And if you can go kind of over there, you guys on the left, maybe you can see in the lower jaw it has a very large tusk. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a male. But then look on the... Okay, here's the, the cheekbone, lower jaw of uh, the number one rhino. But here's a leg bone. This is a femur laying on its face. Huh. That's where we found that. So that's one of those uh, scavenge bones that got displaced and moved before uh, the skeletons were completely buried. Right. There. That end of the thigh bone should fit up into the hip socket of this rhino right over here. Oh, wow. But when you look so out straight away from you, number five, number four, and the one next to it, same species of rhino. They're growing youngsters. They're older than this calf, but they're not full grown. Okay. They have a couple of extra baby teeth that have erupted into their jaw. And then when you look at the, the leg bones, the end caps, the epiphyses are not fused to the right. shaft of the bone. Right. So these are growing youngsters here. Huh. The two skeleton is a horse. Look how different it's shaped. Oh, okay. This is one of the larger horses that's, that's found here. And it happens to be one of the three toad species, too. Huh. Quite a complete skeleton. Uh, let, let's just check it out. Something interesting here I want to show you. So, so here's the skull, right guys? The skull and lower jaws, there's the neck vertebrae, shoulder blade. This front leg is folded back on its chest. This is its chest, right? There's the ribs. Follow the backbone back, like you can see all the tail bones to the tip of the tail. Here's one back leg going this way. Another one right down there. So if you would be standing like over where Patrick is, you can see both back feet. So we've got one right front foot here, right? We've got two back legs, two back feet over there. But this horse should have one of the horse's other front feet. Oh, wow. Some more scavenging. Or not? No. Here, here's the right front foot. Here's the oh, left front foot. Oh, it's stretched out. It's stretched. How's that? It's stretched out. Is that? Yeah, it, it's stretched out. But uh, it, it may appear that it's scavenged because you can't see the connection with the rest of the leg. Yeah, yeah it's underneath. But it's underneath. Okay. Yeah. So the horse died. That drifted under by ash, then the rhino died later. Okay. Look right down here. Here's another horse. Here's a rib cage of a horse. This horse's front feet are right there. This horse's skull and lower jaw are right under there. So there's another horse hiding underneath these two rhinos. Wow. Here's a third horse that's down at the same level of ash. The, the horses died about the same time. This one is rolled over on its back. The, the, this one was uh, uh, scavenged before it, it was buried. Yeah. Number seven is a llama-sized camel. There's the skull. You can see the edge of the cheek teeth. Quite a long neck right through there. And then there's a leg back here and another leg. That camel is laying side by side with the horse. So camels and horses died about the same time. Right. Once again, the drifted under. Rhinos may have lived a week or two after before they finally met their end. And so you think it's because of their size, their lungs were... Maybe Bone capacity more. apparently had something to do with that, yeah. Huh. So here you've got this light gray volcanic ash, 
the bones have kind of a whitish color and uh, some bones do have a tinge of brown like this right here yeah but that whitish color to the bone is an abnormal bone growth that's diseased bone pathologic bone hmm. some places it's just very th a thin uh, layer a thin veneer but look how thick and patchy it is right there follow this rhino's leg down to the ulna the funny bone you can see bumps of that abnormal white bone growth hmm. look at its toes very bumpy look out at it, number six <coughs> the ribs are very thick uh, they have a thick white bumpy stuff on it patches of it on the pelvis when an animal develops severe lung damage, the secondary results can be something called Marie's disease, okay. hypertrophic osteopathy, and then uh, along with the lung damage, uh, inflammation of the leg bones and inflammation of the soft tissue around the bone, and then that abnormal bone growth. Huh. Especially if it's something you guys haven't seen yet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're hoping to find a carnivore. This uh, superheated ash that it welded together, and and it's from near this crater in southwest Idaho. Okay. So whenever the Yellowstone hotspot uh, produces an eruption, it's taken place across this path. The this most is... recent eruptions are right here where Yellowstone Park is. That's where it gets its name, Yellowstone Hotspot. Right. But then you see that the, this crustal plate has been moving over the top of the hot spot. If this is the hot spot, the crustal plate moves over the hot spot. Right. So back 12 million years ago, this eruption took place in the hot spot, or the, the, the magma chamber, the hot spot was under uh, southwest Idaho. But then uh, the crustal plate moves about an inch a year. Wow. And so over that time, 12 million inches later, <laughs> uh, the hot spot is over in this neighborhood now. So then, okay, so this is the ash fall. That's the source the of the ash fall. Okay. Ash, the Bruno Jarbidge Eruptive Center. Okay. This Mike Perkins at the University of Utah sampled every ash bed he could find in the Great Plains in the early 1990s. Wow. Chemical analysis. Not only the, 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 the chemistry of the ash, but then also the, um, the, the, the radioactive isotope right. uh, dates of them, and uh, was able to trace them back to specific eruptions. Many of the Great Plains ash beds did originate as, as Yellowstone, hmm. uh, Yellowstone ash.